This is the next and last time I can say happy Friday. At least and have some accuracy anyway with you guys. <clears throat> How's everybody doing today? Everybody ready for a big weekend? No. Everybody ready for the most misnamed week of the whole term? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I hope to liven you guys today. I, I felt like last term I've never seen such a, such a tired looking class. And I, I hope it wasn't my lecture, but maybe it was. I don't know. So we, I will try to liven things up today. Maybe jump a lot or something like that. I did promise everybody a song. Um, the song actually relates not to what I'm talking about now, but actually to translation. Should we do the song first to start on the right foot? Okay, let's do that. So, anybody know the song Maria from West Side Story? Yes. All right. I want to hear you singing loud then, those of you who know this song. This one really works well if I have accompaniment, you know, like people helping me to sing it, but unfortunately, I don't have that. It goes, translation. The most intricate thing I ever saw. From five prime to three prime, translation, translate. That's the accompaniment. The final step that we know about the central dogma. Amino carboxyl translation, 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 translation. I just learned the steps of translation and all the things they say about tRNA are true. Translation to form peptide bonds in translation. The ribosomal cleft must bind to an EFTU. Translation, AUG binds the F Mets cargo. 16S lines up Shine and Delgarno. Translation. I'll never stop needing translation. The most intricate thing I ever saw. Translation. You guys. No, no, no. I probably should take that applause because I heard one person over here singing. I didn't hear anybody else in the whole cloud do, class do anything but giggle. And I'm sure it was not me that you were giggling at him. Well, okay. So, all right. So much for translation. All right. All right. Um, gene expression. So I want to come back and say a couple things about gene expression just to reiterate those points. I know from talking to several of you at the end of the last class period, you had a little bit of confusion about IPTG and XGAL. So I want to just say something about those two, okay? Keep in mind we're talking about an operon, the LAC operon. The LAC operon is a collection of genes under the control of a single promoter that's in E. coli. Okay? The things that we do with IPTG and with XGAL involve manipulations of that promoter. That promoter turns out to be, we know how that promoter works, we know what turns that promoter on. We can make those manipulations. We know what the gene product is, which is the beta galactosidase, among other things, and we can use that. So that's what all of this is aimed at. Okay? So I told you that IPTG was a molecule that looks very much to the repressor, which is really all that matters. It looks to the repressor like, in fact, it is allolactose. Okay? If we start out with the operon, and this could have the ZYA gene as we see here, or this could have some gene that we have inserted in there. Maybe I decided I want to make bacteria make a whole bunch of human growth hormone. I put human growth hormone in here in place of this, but use the same promoter setup. I can control bacteria's making of human growth hormone. Okay. So that's part of what I'm after here. In this case, 
I want to tell the bacteria, okay, now you've gotten big, you've gotten healthy, I want you to start making a whole bunch of human growth hormone. All right? Well, if I have this setup where I have human growth hormone here and I have this control region up here, all I have to do to have these bacteria make human growth hormone is add IPTG. IPTG will bind to the repressor, and when it binds to the repressor, what happens is this. The repressor binds to the IPTG. By the way, the IPTG, or allolactose, is called an inducer. Something that induces transcription is an inducer. In this case, the inducer is IPTG. The repressor binds IPTG. Now the repressor does not block the promoter, and transcription can occur, and in fact does occur. We make messenger RNA. This could be the ZYA genes. This could be human growth hormone. doesn't really matter. What matters is that we have caused this gene to be made, and because we've used IPTG, which doesn't get broken down by the cell, it just keeps going on and on and on. It's the ever ready, bu ever ready bunny, right? It doesn't stop. It keeps making more and more and more. So using this inducible system, I can make bacteria make what I want to make when I want it to make it, and it'll just keep making it as long as I'm growing, as long as I have living bacteria. That's one use for these chemicals. IPTG is very, very useful for that. The other chemical I talked about is XGAL. Okay? XGAL also man-made chemical, looks to the beta-galactosidase, that's the Z gene, it looks to the beta-galactosidase like it is, in fact, lactose. Okay, So what beta-galactosidase will do is it will take X-gal and it will cleave it, just as if it were lactose. When it cleaves it, a molecule is made that produces a blue color. Now, this blue color is a very useful indicator of places where beta-galactosidase is being made. Now, I promised you a figure last time. I couldn't find it, but today I have the figure for you to show you a very useful illustration of how powerful this uh, selection is. It's actually down here, and it relates to this. Okay, This happens to be an egg from a transgenic chicken. Okay, In this chicken, in the genome of this chicken, someone has placed the beta-galactosidase gene, that's the Z gene, not under the control of the lac promoter, but under the control of a promoter that's specific for muscle cells. Okay, It's specific for muscle cells. Now, the beauty here is Wherever, when I add XGAL to this mixture, any place I see blue, I know beta-galactosidase is being made. And since beta-galactosidase is being controlled by a promoter that's specific for muscle cells, I now know the regions in this developing embryo where the muscle cells are going to appear. That's incredibly useful. Incredibly useful. Okay. Now, there are a zillion uses for this kind of technology. Right? But the key is the fact that this X-gal tells us where beta-galactosidase is being made. OK? Questions about that? Yes? Does the blue product get broken down? It will eventually fade. That's correct. It will. Yeah. Okay, so there are a zillion uses of this stuff. All right, so XGAL and IPTG. Don't forget these are artificial man-made chemicals. These are not cellular products. Very common misconception that students have. Okay? Yes, sir? I have a question actually relating to the last lecture about antibiotics. You said uh, two of the three were man-made. Yes. Uh, but streptomycin and isn't diphtheria toxin made by the... Yeah. So streptomycin, the, the, the versions that we use have been altered and actually constitute man-made, but they do have their origins in biology. So diphtheria toxin is not a man-made toxin. You are correct. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Uh, what's the difference between beta galactosidase and lactase? beta galactosidase and lactase. Well, they are uh, of different origins. Lactase is an enzyme that we make. Beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that bacteria make. 
but they do catalyze the same reaction. But they can be found in eukaryotic cells like Your question is, would they catalyze a reaction on X-Gal? Uh, no, my question was, uh, they're found in both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Lactase is found in our cells, so it's in eukaryotic cells. Beta-galactosidase is found in uh, bacterial cells. And our cells will not act on X-Gal. I mean, our, our lactase will not act on X-Gal. Okay, and that was my question, is why is it acting? Why are we seeing beta-galactosidase in here? Because I made a transgenic chicken. Oh, okay. I made a chicken in which I fused the beta-galactase, good question, beta-galactase gene to a promoter for muscle cells. Okay? That's the key to this thing. So what I'm looking for is any place that promoter is active, and I know from previous work this promoter is active in muscle cells and only in muscle cells. So I'm looking to see in this developing embryo where the muscle cells are arising from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And a question back here? Well, I was, I was wondering, how do you insert, like, the like that? Yeah. Yes. So it's a very good question. How do we insert DNA into eukaryotic cells? It might be easier if I talk to you afterwards with that. Okay. So there's a lot of technology that's necessary to do that. It's not a trivial thing to make a transgenic organism. Uh, these can be done in a couple of ways, but I'd be happy to meet with you separately if you'd like to hear about that, okay? Good. There is a, a class that we teach in biochemistry called Intro to Molecular Biology, which is a little bit more technique-oriented. It's not a, a biochem class per se, but it does cover some of the techniques and so forth, kind of like what you're asking about here. But, I, but I, again, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay, other questions? All right. All right. So that's um, what's up with those two guys. They're really very useful for us. Um, when we look at the E. coli genome, we see something interesting. This is the entire 6 million base pairs of the E. coli genome. And what you see mapped on there are all the places where the lac promoter is found. Whoa. OK. It's only found one place. It's only useful for one situation when lactose is present. By comparison, here's another promoter called PUR. PUR is involved in purine metabolism. Okay? Look at the number of places we see the PUR promoter on the E. coli genome. What would that tell you if, you, if I showed you this on an exam and I said, you know, what, what does this tell us about the PUR promoter, for example? It activates a lot of genes, obviously, but why do I have a bunch of PURs and only one LAC promoter? Any thoughts? Purine metabolism is more important. Purine metabolism is more important? Well, yeah, okay, that's part of it. You're getting there. More controlled, meaning? Because that was a control freak. No, not quite that. Okay, what's that? It is more common. You need to be able to make it uh, much more quickly? Mm, not more quickly. No, I would say no to that. Yes, uh, Anjali? Is it promoted farther from the consensus sequence? No, not that. Julie? Does it have to be done with the expression of the genes on those operators that efficiently It does. So those genes have common needs. Very common needs. All right? So we could imagine a situation where I have one circumstance at the cell. Uh, hits and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of related things that are all needed. So they're all needed under the same circumstance. The lac's only needed in one circumstance and that's the circumstance where lactose appears. There's no other common commonalities to the needs for gene expression with respect to lactose metabolism. But there are common needs with respect to this promoter. And this is not an uncommon situation with a, with a, with a promoter. Promoters, common promoters on different operons will tell us those operons have the same needs, physio give the, supply the same needs to the cell when a circumstance arises. That's the, 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 the importance of commonality. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Let's see. This figure shows, uh, I wasn't very good about showing figures lately, but this figure shows there's the cap protein binding to this region next to the promoter. If we think about the organization of things, this is, the, this is where the cap protein binds. This is the promoter. Down here would be the operator. Down here would be the transcriptional start site. Okay. 
So we can see that the, the cap protein, when it binds to cyclic AMP, binds to this region of DNA and facilitates the start of transcription. Cap is what we would call a positive regulator of transcription. It's helping transcription to get started. The lac repressor is a negative regulator of transcription. It turns it off. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to turn our attention now from prokaryotes, where a tremendous amount is known, to eukaryotes, eukaryotes, where not so much is known, or not quite as much is known, but there's still an awful lot that's known about eukaryotic transcription. And I'm going to go into some detail about at least a couple of examples of genes with respect to this. Okay. The first of these, uh, I want to talk, before I talk about that, I need to talk about the organization of chromosomes in eukaryotes. All right? Eukaryotic genomic DNA is organized fundamentally different than prokaryotic genomic DNA. Prokaryotes, first of all, you remember, have a circular chromosome. Eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. You knew that. I trust you also know that eukaryotes have much longer chromosomes than do prokaryotes. I've talked before about the fact that if we take all the DNA in a single eukaryotic cell that fits into the nucleus about the size of a bacterium, that eukaryotic DNA will stretch seven feet. That's a tremendous problem to squeeze that DNA into that nucleus. Okay? Squeezing that DNA into that nucleus requires proteins. All right? Prokaryotes do not have this problem. Their DNAs are a thousand fold smaller. They're one one thousandth the size of eukaryotic DNAs. All right? Eukaryotic DNAs really are big. We've got to fit them into that nucleus, and the way we fit them into that nucleus is by coiling them up. We can take a, uh, a, uh, a um, roll this big that fits in my hand and fit 500 feet of kite string onto it very easily because we roll the string on the roll itself. That's what you're seeing in the picture here. Eukaryotic DNA is rolled onto proteins. Rolling facilitates the compaction of that DNA so that it will fit into a eukaryotic nucleus. The proteins then are of considerable interest. Okay? The proteins um, are, um, have, have a name as a class. They are called histones, H-I-S-T-O-N-E-S. And there are five primary histones that we will talk about. Okay? Now, I'll show you those in a second. But if we look at this, what you see in this image is uh, a chromosome that has been sort of peeled apart and laid out on, in an electron microscope. It gives the appearance of what we call beads on a string. These little things right here are the coils where the DNA is wrapping around this core of proteins. There are two copies of four, four proteins that are found in this. I'll show you that in a second. So the beads are where the proteins are and the DNA is wrapped around them. Just like beads on a string, we think about the string that goes through a necklace that has beads on it. The DNA is, of course, the string. And the regions between the beads are called linker regions. I want you to remember that term because I'm going to tell you something about linker regions in just a second. Now, it takes, as I said, some sort of pulling apart the chromosome in order for us to see this. Because it turns out chromosomes do a tremendous amount of winding. They don't just wind around one of these little cores like you see here. Okay? In fact, they wind a core, then they wind the cores, and they wind the cores of the cores, and the cores of the cores. The reason that you can physically see chromosomes in a cell is because of all this winding and winding and winding and winding of winding. Okay? Well, Imagine that you're an RNA polymerase, and this is in three dimensions. You see it in two dimensions here. Imagine this is a three-dimensional array of wines. And imagine you're an RNA polymerase that needs to transcribe a gene way back in here. The complexity of doing that is enormous. Okay? Absolutely enormous. And it's only now that we're beginning to understand how it is that cells 
find and transcribe genes buried way inside of here. Okay? So that's part of what I'm going to be talking about today. Well, let's talk about the histone proteins first. And when we talk about histone proteins, we see there's the wrapping. We actually see on the inside, this is DNA on the outside. This is, these are proteins on the inside. The histone proteins that form the core of that wrapped structure, as I said, there are four proteins, two copies each. So there's a total of eight proteins inside of this core. The proteins have, have names. They're called histone H2A, histone H2B, or not to be, ha uh -huh. <laughs> You guys are getting dead again. Histone H3 and histone H4. So there's two copies of each of those histones in the core of this wrapped structure. Okay? Now, that bead that you saw earlier has a name. This wrapped core is called a nucleosomal core particle. A nucleosomal core particle. That's the fundamental building block of a nucleosome. Nucleosome being the big complex between DNA and proteins. Okay? So the nucleosomal core particle we can think of as the fundamental building block of a nucleosome. There it is from the side. You see the DNA is wrapped around the outside. The core particle, uh, the, the proteins are on the inside. There's a schematic representation of the same thing. The core particle, to give you an idea, is about 230 or so base pairs in length. Okay? It's not an overly large structure. This shows those four proteins that I just described to you. And if we look at their overall structure, we see something, oh, wow. They really have very common structures. They look alike. They look an awful lot alike. Not only do they look an awful lot alike, but if we compare H2A in human beings to H2A in something as distantly uh, evolutionary related as yeast, we see the very same things. They're very, very similar. They don't change much over evolutionary time. And when we see things that don't change over evolutionary time, we know that that structure is very critical to its function. If we change that structure significantly, we will lose the function and maintaining the function of wrapping up DNA is a very, very important function. If we don't do that, the DNA doesn't fit in the cell. Okay. Now, I said there were five histones. You see four of them here. What happened to the fifth one? Okay. Well, you might begin to suspect we're missing H1. Where is H1 at? H1 turns out to be a protein found mostly in the linker regions mostly in the linker regions. Okay. Okay. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Okay, questions about those? Do those make sense? Okay, there's a big wrapped complex. It's kind of hard to see the linker regions in this one, but remember I said we had to pull it apart before we really saw those linker regions. Allison? Um, could you review what the difference between a nucleosome and a nucleosomal okay. particle is? Nucleosome is the big complex, like this, of protein with DNA. The nucleosomal core particle would be one of these. Okay, good question. Okay, all right. So that's the basic thing. So we realize now that we've got a real complex problem. When we think about replicating this with a DNA polymerase, or we think about transcribing this with an RNA polymerase, there's a tremendous amount of things that have to be moved around, shoved out of the way, in order for replication and or transcription to occur. I'm going to focus on transcription because that's the sort of theme of the gene expression that we're working on. But the problems also arise with respect to replication. We need to make sure that we don't, that we don't forget that. OK. Uh, Let's talk now 
about the control of the gene expression. So you've seen the logistical problem. The logistical problem is that this thing is really going to be difficult for the cell to, to manage. And at the same time, it's still got to be able to do that management. What I'm showing you on the screen is something that's very important and it's becoming increasing, we're becoming increasingly aware of the importance of. It's a, methyl, it's a methylated base that we see in eukaryotic DNA. When we look in eukaryotic DNA, we frequently find methylated cytosine. Okay? That methyl group right there. Methyl cytosine turns out to play a very important role in controlling gene expression in eukaryotic cells. Okay? A very, very important role in controlling gene expression in eukaryotic cells. By putting a methyl group on this, this doesn't look as much like cytosine as it did before. Okay? It doesn't look as much like cytosine as it did before, and as a consequence of that, the proteins that might bind to it, the transcription factors that might bind to it now don't bind to it nearly as well. Okay? Methylating cytosine has the effect, for the most part, of turning down or even turning off transcription of genes if this cytosine is in the control region, promoter you can think of, okay, for a given uh, gene. All right? Now that's interesting in itself, okay, but it turns out that this methylation carries over when cells replicate their DNA. So if I start out as a skin cell and I've got some of my genes turned off with this methylation, when the replication occurs, the methylation will also occur to keep those genes turned off. Okay? Now, this type of inherited, this is actually an inherited thing because it's being passed from one cell to the other, gives rise to a phenomenon that you've heard of, I'm sure, called epigenetics. Epigenetics is a very, very exciting area of understanding gene expression. It's a type of inheritance that does not involve the genetic code. This methyl group is being inherited from one cell to the next. It does not involve the genetic code. Interestingly, when we go back to the zygotic stage, okay, many of these groups will be lost. We will, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, wipe the slate clean and get set up for this. Well, this becomes wiping the slate clean becomes important because we can imagine that in differentiating a cell, we, a cell, we want to turn on certain groups of genes, turn off other groups of genes. Methylation may play a role in that. So if I turn off a group of genes that are destined to become muscle cells like we saw in that earlier figure, I want those genes to stay turned off. So as those muscle cells divide, 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 they're replicating that methyl group and keeping that set of genes turned off. So methylation is very important in that respect. Danielle? Is it possible for, because there's a lot of support on the stem cells, mm -hmm. um, to like take these methyl groups and off to sort of create stem cells? Yeah, oh boy, there's a good question. So can we pull these methyl groups off and recreate embryonic stem cells? That's what you're basically what you're asking me, right? The business of creating embryonic stem cells has many, many variables. And what you've done is you've just identified a very, very important one. The answer is I don't know the, we don't know the answer to that question. There are suggestions. There, there was some very big excitement uh, a few months ago that, in fact, people were claimed they were able to basically reprogram, as it were, adult cells back to embryonic stem cells. If you can do that, then the worries about you know, what the ethics of using embryonic uh, cells or embryos to get these cells goes away. Um, more recently, in the past month or so, it appears that that reprogramming shows that there's still some other things that haven't been considered, and my suspicion strongly is that these haven't been completely removed. So I, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but I, th I think it's a very relevant one. OK. So we have to keep these things in mind. Now, it turns out that alterations to both DNA and to proteins in chromosomes affect gene expression. So here's an alteration to DNA that affects gene expression. I'm going to describe to you in a second alterations to histones that will also affect gene expression. Okay. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier is that histones are being wrapped by DNA. You knew that part. 
What I didn't tell you was the chemical nature of the histones. Let's think about this. The charge on the backbone of DNA is what? Negative or positive? Negative. What do you suppose the charge on the histones is? Positive. It's positive, okay? And it's positive because the histones are very rich in lysine residues. Lysines have a positive charge at physiological pH. There's a very natural match between the negative charge of the DNA and the positive charge of the histones. Okay? That becomes important because if I have histones that are unmodified, okay, if I have histones that are unmodified, this structure really is nice. It's very compact. I don't have to worry about um, fitting everybody together. I, if you think about it, I've got negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. I mean, they all just scratch up very nicely, like, almost like a little crystal. Not quite a crystal, but something like that. Okay. If I alter the histone, okay, by altering its positive charge, then it doesn't fit so nice. And it turns out that's very good if I want to turn on transcription. Because you remember I said it's going to be very difficult for RNA polymerase to get in here and find the thing that it needs to do its, its business. But what if I loosen up this structure so that RNA polymerase can get in or the transcription factors can get in and do their thing? Might not that make transcription easier? And the answer is yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. Now, the alteration that happens to histones is histones get an, a, an acetyl group put on them. And it gets put onto the positive end of the lysine side chain. So when we acetylate lysines, we loosen the nucleosomal structure. We loosen it up. Now it's not held so tightly together because all right, those positive charges on the, on the uh, histones are not so tightly holding that DNA. This guy is loosening up. It's breathing, as it were, if you want to think about it that way. Okay? So acetylation is a very important consideration when we talk about gene expression in eukaryotic cells. That becomes relevant now for the example I'm going to show you, which is how we control expression of genes using what's called a steroid receptor. Okay? A steroid receptor. All right. Questions before I go do that? Yes, sir? Okay. If that's the ultimate, you know, the ultimate question. What controls, controls, the controls, the controls? Okay. So the environmental circumstances will ultimately control that. But what I'm going to show you here, you'll see a factor that is helping to control that in the steroid receptor. So bear with me, and I, I hope you'll, you'll hopefully get at least a partial answer to your question. I won't claim it's a complete answer. Okay? All right. So steroid receptor. Steroid receptor is uh, an important protein that plays a role in controlling genes that steroid hormones can turn on. We know that st taking steroid hormones has effects. It changes things. You get that deep voice, right? You go out, you swat home runs, right? Did you know that taking too many steroids in men causes breast development? Did you know that? Do you know why? The what? Overproduction of estrogen from the excess uh, androgens that are being applied. That's right. Yep. So, and people taking steroids also start producing less testosterone as a body's response to that. So I think it's kind of kind of amusing to think of. Anyway, all right. So the hormone receptor, the, the nuclear hormone receptor, which is in this case a steroid uh, hormone receptor, okay, is a very important controller. Shh, shh, is a very important controller of gene expression. Okay. This shows a schematic diagram of the steroid hormone receptor. Okay. This is in fact an estradiol uh, binding protein. All right. We'll see how this plays in just a second. Now. This is showing you a schematic representation. You know I don't do an awful lot of things with structures, but this is one place where structure is going to be very interesting and important. The reason it's interesting and important is this protein has a region that binds to DNA, and this, pro this, this protein has a region that binds to the hormone. And it turns out that the binding of the hormone has no effect whatsoever on the binding of this protein to the DNA. That's kind of surprising because 
This is a transcription factor. And what it normally does is it activates transcription. So if the binding of the hormone does not affect the binding to the DNA, how in the world does it affect transcription? Okay. This is the first clue that we see of the role of multiple proteins in eukaryotic cells controlling transcription. I'm going to show it to you in a second. But I want you to keep in mind the fact that this protein binds to estradiol in a different place than it, than it binds to DNA. So when estradiol binds to the, um, uh, the receptor in the cell membrane, the receptor internalizes this and it goes and it travels down to the nucleus and goes and binds to a target DNA. Okay. There it is, there's estradiol binding to it. And we see a structural change that happens. There's definitely a structural change that happens to this protein, but the structural change does not affect the DNA binding domain at all. So in the absence or even in the presence of estradiol, this guy can bind to DNA. This shows what actually happens in the, in the cell. Okay? Now it's showing it as if it's bound to DNA first, and you can think of it that way if you want to, although that's not even really necessary. But here's the receptor that I was talking about before. You can see its DNA binding domain is clearly bound to DNA. And in this case, you see that there is no estradiol bound to the other portion of the protein. Binding of estradiol okay, to this receptor causes a change, not in the structure at the DNA binding region, but in the other end of the protein. Okay, so we're bound to DNA here, we're bound to DNA here, we have no estradiol here, we have estradiol here, so clearly estradiol hasn't affected the binding to the DNA, but it has affected the structure of this guy out here. Once this structure out here changes, this now becomes a target for binding by another protein called a co-activator. I told you eukaryotic expression, eukaryotic transcriptional control was much more complex. This is a simple representation of what's happening. Okay? The coactivator all right, binds here, and the coactivator can do several things. One thing it can do is it can help to bind even other proteins to start making the transcriptional apparatus. That's one thing it can do. Another thing that some coactivators do is they can put acetyl groups onto lysines. Okay? All right, now that you know what putting acetyl groups onto lysines does, we start seeing how this tight complex can start loosening up solely as a result of binding a single transcription factor. Does that partly answer your question? Okay. All right. Now, so this is actually going to be the first of a series of steps that's going to result ultimately in transcription. We have, we're not at transcription yet, but we've got a coactivator here. That coactivator may be helping other factors to bind. It may be acetylating lysines. It may be doing both. Okay? But we started the wheels turning now to start transcription of this gene. Okay? All right. Uh, where was I? Okay. Here's something called tamoxifen. People have heard of tamoxifen. And you know that tamoxifen acts as an antagonist, meaning it's basically blocking the function of the estradiol hormone receptor here. Tamoxifen looks like estradiol, at least to some extent, to the um, uh, receptor protein, the estradiol, the hormone receptor protein. And it binds to the hormone receptor protein, but it blocks the binding site for the coactivator. Stops the coactivator from being able to interact with it. It's in this way that tamoxifen is turning off those hormone response elements. It's stopping transcription of these same genes that estradiol would be turning on. If estradiol binds the receptor, this whole class of genes gets turned on. If tamoxifen binds the receptor, this whole class of genes does not get turned on. Okay? So we're stopping that hormone response, basically, as a result of using tamoxifen. Well, that's very important because some hormones are, in fact, estrogen-sensitive hormones. Uh, estrogens, some hormones. Some cancer cells are estrogen-sensitive. 
blocking estrogen function in this way may stop the ability of these cells to proliferate. Okay. Now, uh, that's actually a structure. I don't need to worry about that. Okay, so that's a side light. I'll tell you one more thing. And the one last thing now is to start getting this bigger picture of transcription that's actually occurring when transcription does occur. So I'm back to having estradiol on there now, right? Okay, tamoxifen was a side light. All right. Well, I told you that histone acetyl transferases, that, that those are the names of enzymes that put acetyl groups onto lysines. A histone acetyl transferase. Some coactivators are histone acetyl transferases. Okay? The actual reaction that they catalyze is here. There's a lysine side chain with a positive charge. There's an acetyl group. Bang, we've removed the positive, we've covered up the positive charge. Okay? So we've stopped the positive charge, no positive charge, less interaction with the DNAs as a result and loosening up of that complex. It turns out that not only does having an acetyl group on lysine loosen up that, that structure of the nucleosome, not only does that happen, but it turns out that acetyl lysine is also a target for some proteins that bind to DNA. Some proteins have a domain, that is a region of them, that specifically recognizes and binds to acetyl lysine. That domain in those proteins has a name. It's called a bromo domain. domain. And these proteins are, as you might imagine, proteins that are going to be very important for transcription. Where they see a bromo domain, the cell is saying, hey, we want to transcribe this gene. Come and bind here. Okay. What, how does this all come together? This all comes together as follows. Okay. Let's look to see what I've just described to you. A transcription factor, let's say the, the hormone receptor has come in, it's bound to in this case, estradiol, that has allowed a coactivator to come along and bind to that hormone receptor. The coactivator in this case is a, uh, a histone acetyl transferase. It puts some acetyl groups onto lysines. We see loosening of the structure, and we see binding now of proteins that have bromodomains that are binding right here. Now there are many proteins that have bromodomains, but this is one example of a protein that has a bromodomain that has a very important function. It's called remodeling engine. What's the function of remodeling engine? It's basically to clear out a space, to open up a region of DNA so those transcription factors, TF2D, TF2H, TF2A, et cetera, can come in and let RNA polymerase get started. Okay? In order for those guys to bind, we've got to have an open region of DNA, and that open region of DNA is made by the remodeling engine. Yes, Jen. Kind of, kind of susceptible at that point. Yeah. yeah, these happen fairly quickly. So I would say on the order of minutes. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take very long for that to happen. Yeah. But it's a good question. Because the proteins do provide some structure and integrity to the DNA. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Can these histone states be inherited as well? I'm sorry? Can these histones be inherited as well? Can these histones what? Like different acetylations, like can they be inherited as well? Oh, can the acetylations be inherited? In fact, no. The, the, the acetylations, as far as I know, are not inherited. And in fact, it turns out that we don't want these things to stay on for necessarily a long time. Although I, I, you could see where, given the comparison for the turning off, this might be nice to turn on. But as far as I know, that doesn't happen over a longer period of time. Cells put on acetyl groups, and cells also take off acetyl groups. Okay? 
Now, taking off the acetyl groups turns out to be very important. If we don't turn, take off those acetyl groups, we're going to have an unwrapped region of chromatin. And we start unwrapping all the regions of chromatin, we're going to have the same problem we had of fitting everything in, in the first place. So we want to be able to unwrap it, but we also want to be able to wrap it back, back up. If we take off those acetyl groups, what's going to happen to the, to the nucleosomal structure? Okay. It is, in fact, going to get more compact. We're going to have, be less likely to have transcription happening. Right? Acetyls favor transcription. Removal of acetyls stop transcription. All right? Now, the reason I mention this is it turns out that there's a really interesting group of proteins called sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S. Sirtuins have been linked in several cell types to longevity. How long an organism will live. All right? And if you're interested in, in this topic, it's one of my favorite topics. I'll be happy to tell you more. Come by and I'll, I'll tell you more. However, sirtuins turn out to be histone deacetylases. Histone deacetylases. They turn, or they, 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 they turn, but they remove the acetyl groups from lysine and turn off transcription for many, many genes. Okay, so sirtuins are very important in that respect. Other questions? All right, then let us go and go forth to the weekend and not multiply. <laughs>